Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to this episode of Behind the Veil. Today I'm joined by Lucy who's a dear friend and client as well alhamdulillah. Lucy and I have been working together and I've been so blessed to witness your growth and to be inspired by you as well alhamdulillah. Lucy welcome do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you for that beautiful introduction. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So I'm I'm Lucy. I was born in Italy. I grew up in Paris. And alhamdulillah, Islam found me about nine years ago when I first moved to London. What I do, what I do for work, my work world is just an extension of who I am. So I'm a I'm a business coach to women. And I help them grow their business um, using their spirituality and femininity as their superpowers. And what I like to say as well behind the scenes, what I'm actually doing is I see your light and I shine it back at you. Because oh. I believe that Allah, the creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, has created us all with this individuality. And when I'm working with someone, that's all I'm ever doing is reflecting that back. And combined with this idea of the only one you'll ever need to do anything is um, Allah, the creator, working on that relationship. The two together then adds up to business growth and all the all the things that you want to achieve and all your dreams coming true. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do, alhamdulillah, and that's a bit about who I am. That's just an amazing way to put it. I love that because one thing that, I think about a lot is the light that my clients carry when they come to me, especially Muslim female coaches, but they don't see it themselves. And I felt the same way about you. And I feel the same way about all the mentees that I work with at the moment. Alhamdulillah. So what you said there is for me, it's, it's spot on. So let's talk about this a little bit. What do you think is the reason why the women that come to us or even ourselves sometimes we don't see that light within. The An element of the answer to this is the reason that we were created in community is so that we can reflect parts of each other to one another. I think no one actually understands the light that we have within, as you said. We need someone else to reflect that back. And as coaches, we're simply mirrors to what we see in our clients. And... For us to be able to see what we have inside, what makes us unique, we need people around us to be able to mirror that. So I think it's it's by the beautiful design of, of, of the creator, right? For mm -hmm. us to interact with those around us so that they can show us the parts of ourselves that we're not aware of or that we haven't discovered yet. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like it justifies our need for community. It's not necessarily a bad thing that we don't see the light within without other people. Exactly. Interesting. I would have said oh, it's, it's because we are conditioned to make ourselves small all the time, um, which could also play into this. And, and it doesn't cancel the fact that, yes, we need other people to reflect to us the beauty that we have within us, alhamdulillah. But yeah, how do you feel about this idea i know that you work with muslim women especially and women in general do you reckon that there is a tendency from women to make themselves small and to fear putting themselves out there absolutely definitely definitely i'd say it's something that comes um that comes back to me the most in in the people that i work with i think as women we've been conditioned to kind of quieten our voices, to dim our lights. Um, and I think the world at the moment is probably in a in quite a broken place. I think we'd all agree. And I personally believe that there's a role for women to play in changing the dynamic in this world. Because we have, I mean, our when we think of women, we think of our strength, our spiritual uh, strength, our creativity, our intuition. I think there's something that we need to use to almost fix some of the the things that are going wrong in this in this world. So we have a massive role to play. I think it's just uh, it's for us to find our place in 
a society that hasn't always put us at the forefront and it's not to denigrate men at all. We need both, but I think there's now's the time for us to kind of not rise necessarily because it seems a bit um, extreme, but at least be placed um, in our true right and placed in the forefront and stop dimming our lights. Yes. Mm. And you've chosen to do this through entrepreneurship, which means that you've taken the risk to quit a stable or a job that was conforming to the standards of what society deems to be a stable job, right? What led you to do that? The simple answer to that was boredom, actually. So Alhamdulillah, I started my business about three years ago now. And before that, I was I was working in the business world and it taught me so, so much. Like I was working in startups. I was working for a tech startup at one point in advertising, hospitality as well at one point. And what I really got to do while doing that was understand what it takes to um, to run a business. But as I progressed in my role, I built a team, I was doing all kinds of really cool things, but then I just sat there one day and I was like, there's something missing. And I think I always knew that I wanted to start my business. And I took that there's something missing and being bored as the the opportunity to to quit, leave, and to start my own thing. So I I jumped ship. I took a big risk. Um, it paid off, alhamdulillah. But that was the moment where I decided, okay, I'm just going to go and and actually, when I left my job, I didn't know about coaching. It was a complete unknown. And then coaching found me because it's always what happens. Our last panel data puts the things that we need the most on our on our journey. And he did. I found coaching and then built my business around that. Mm. What would you say it took for you to get to that point where you were confident taking that risk? Because I'm guessing it didn't happen overnight, right? It didn't happen overnight. There was a lot of there was a lot of burnout involved. So I was very I was very exhausted as well, exhausted from doing things that weren't fulfilling me. And I think it got to a point as well where I was like, do I want to do this for the rest of my life? And the answer was no. So I left. Um, but yes, it, it took some reflection, but I'm someone who does just like, when I when I get an idea, I do just like act on it. So, and I almost don't let doubt seep in too much because otherwise you can drive yourself crazy. So I did, I was just like, I'm leaving. I handed in my resignation and, and left. That's the definition of tawakkul for me. Yeah, yeah. And okay, yeah. where were you in your spiritual journey at, at that point? So at that point, I I had found Islam, but I wasn't practicing in any in any sense. So the way I found Islam was when I first moved to London about um, nine years ago, and I found I found a lot of answers through the Quran specifically, and it was like my heart just connected to the words of the book, subhanAllah. And although I always had that element of faith in me, the practice was not in place because I didn't understand the importance of it. So where I was at in my journey at that point was I had that faith, that never, the the belief in, in Allah, the belief in the Prophet wasallam, but I wasn't necessarily practicing. But there was there was an element of tawakkul for sure. That was something that was always embedded in me. Like this idea of things happen for a reason. There's destiny, which in, in Arabic would be qadar Allah, I guess. And I believed in that. And I guess that's what fueled my decision to leave and to trust. Mm. And I'm sure that's only one way that religion has changed your perspective on like work is there any other ways or any mindset shift that Islam has brought to you when it comes specifically to like your relationship with work, maybe with earning, maybe with becoming an entrepreneur or being a Muslim woman in business as, as well? 
There are so, so many. I think the the one concept which I really love is this idea of baraka. So you'd probably translate that as blessings. And I think it comes from having a pure intention. And when you have that pure intention of doing good through your business, of doing good in every area of your life, like from the people that you interact with to bringing it back to business, the clients you interact with, if you have that intention of good, baraka is going to come. So blessings are going to come. And I think it's starting there. And it's what I at least try my very best to infuse in, in everything I do is starting with that pure intention. Why are you doing this? And for me personally, it's always removing, it's removing this idea of I'm doing it for the money. Because I believe money comes as a result. It's again, it's a form of baraka. It's a form of blessing that comes when you do good. So that intention of I'm going to serve, and I think this is something that's really at the, the essence of coaching, is I'm going to serve the person that's opposite me. I'm going to serve my client. I'm going to serve the community. And then as a result, then so many blessings come from that. Countless, countless. You know what I'm hearing with this? I keep on coming uh, across content about detachment from non-Muslims, uh, content creators, and... I feel like Islam is all about this, detach from the dunya and attach your heart to what truly matters, which is your creator and what's to come after this life. Um, and so I, I love this idea of, of also joining this with the concept of baraka. So baraka is like be really intentional, but also realize that you must be doing things in this life for a reason. And, and when you think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you do these beautiful acts, he will put blessings into everything that you touch, that you see, all the people that you meet, the things that you hear. I, I like to remind myself of this because when you start working on your business, it's easy to get obsessed with it um, and to really see it as your baby. And some women will feel that with their children, which is natural. And that's why Allah tells us, like, your children and your possession will be a test for you. And they are what makes this world beautiful. But you also have to detach from these things and to remember, Allah has given me this. It's not actually mine. Like, we don't possess anything in this life. Um, and I know that you are just as passionate as I am when it comes to our businesses, alhamdulillah. So... I thought I'd bring up this notion of like obsession that a lot of women tend to lose themselves in when they create businesses. And this is where the burnout comes in, in too as well. Even if they're not working for someone, they will still end up burning out as entrepreneurs and business women. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where feminine energy comes into play, I'm guessing. So how does it come into play? Mm. It's really beautiful what you said about detachment because the, the way I try to look at it is we're stewards of absolutely everything in this life, the from our businesses to our children to everything. It's it's something that is placed in our in our possession to look after, to cherish. And I think to link it to to burnout, I think our businesses, again, are just something that we're there to, to look after. And I think the risk is if we are too attached to them, if we attach our worth to them if we attach um, something like just anything to our businesses, that's where burnout can happen. So when I think of my own experience, for, for example, with burnout, I was just desperately trying to prove myself, prove myself over and over and over again. I can do more. I'm a valuable asset to the team. Um, you can't you can't build this business without me kind of thing. And that is, that's where it gets very very tricky and the attachment, so the nafs, to bring it back to Islamic spirituality, the nafs is attached to the recognition or the success or um, the acknowledgement that comes with building a business. And I think that is what we need to detach from to, to, um, to essentially um, avoid burnout. Mm. SubhanAllah, what came to mind when you were saying that was 
that a lot of high achieving women, they come across as confident. But if you ask them, why did you become a high achiever? It has to do with a lack of self-esteem, actually, with that need of being validated when they were younger and not getting that and deciding I need to prove myself, as you said. And to do that, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And then that woman becomes incredible at work or at creating a successful business, but she does burn out because she's never getting enough validation because it doesn't matter how many times people people tell you you're amazing or how much money you make. This needs to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from within as well. And that's why being intentional is the most important thing. If you do things for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't matter if you're making 500 pounds per month or 50,000 pounds per month. If you have 10 followers on Instagram or 10,000 followers or 10 million followers on Instagram, you know you're doing this for the reward that comes after this life, not for the validation that most people seek in this life, subhanAllah. So how do we become women who know how to validate themselves and become intentional, whether it's in business or anything that we do? I think the, for me at least, it's it's simple. It's by strengthening our relationship to our creator, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as Muslim women, the way that we detach from all of that, detach from the need to be validated, detach from anything is... Just get to know your your Lord, get to know your creator, because once you once you truly know him, subhanAllah, you understand how much love he has for you. And there is nothing that will ever take away this idea of I am enough. I am enough because I'm enough for my creator. I am enough for Allah. And I think when, as women, we come from that place of I am enough, there's nothing that anyone is going to tell me or anyone is going to say to me that can take that away. I think that's when, as women, we become unstoppable, unstoppable. Mm, absolutely. SubhanAllah, it's so interesting that you're saying that because I just had a therapy session before this conversation. And the past few weeks, all my therapy session end in the same way. It's like, oh, okay, I'm realizing I need to spend more time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to prioritize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. Even if my therapist is not a Muslim, I always come to this conclusion. And it's like, oh, okay. If And if I recall the times where my business was really doing well, and alhamdulillah, it is doing really well now. But the moment it started doing really well was when I let go of the dunya matters and I started studying the deen and that's really when things started unfolding for the healed sister subhanallah but that was the time that I was spending the least time on the business mm -hmm. because I was studying from Monday to Thursday um, most of the day I was studying the deen and that's when things shifted for the business that's when we started getting clients without putting a lot of effort in um, and since then, it's, it has only been growing. And it's almost like Allah is testing me by like giving me all of this abundance and seeing, are you still going to prioritize me now that I've given you everything that you wanted? And it is a difficult test, subhanAllah. You see, that that's the other thing about um, knowing that there is a test in restriction. So when Allah takes away from us, and there's always a test in also being given what we wanted. How are you going to show your gratitude in that moment? Are you going to give more to the dunya or are you going to give more to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you going to get distracted or are you going to spend time cherishing the connection with the one who has given you everything? SubhanAllah. So for me, this is just the continuation of my therapy session right now. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Something, alhamdulillah, there's something so counterintuitive. And again, coming back to this idea of baraka, like it's true. The more you focus on your relationship with Allah, the more doors open. It's I cannot explain it, and only Allah has the answers to this. But exactly the same for me. The more time I started dedicated to my in, to understanding, to just building on that relationship with my with my Lord everything just everything started opening clients opportunities ease as well 
um just everything so there's a there's a secret there's a secret of the universe in this it's not a lot. secret i think it's um the manifestation in real life of the hadith i am as my servant sees me so when we detach from the dunya and we say ya allah i trust you i trust you not a hundred percent i trust you 200 percent this is us saying i know he's the provider I know he's going to take care of me. I know he's the most generous. And that's what he shows us. So when you quit your job because you feel like it's not in alignment with the type of woman that you want to be, you know that you will be a better Muslim if you do do that. And even if that that sense of fear is there, you just decide to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah might make you go through a tough phase of lack and poverty even but in that moment if you surrender and you keep on trusting him he will give you so much after that test subhanallah this is what happened for me and, and maybe it has happened to you as well um i know that you've been through difficult times with your business there's those moments where you wake up and you're like is this the right thing to do should i keep on going but when you hold on to this idea of Allah is the most generous and if I truly believe that I'm doing something good with this and that he is pleased with me, then I will keep on pushing. This here is what make women in business successful. It's the resilience that is based in faith. Exactly. The, um, you put it beautifully. I think the test comes in the in the lack. And I think it's... I think it's a way of Allah of calling us back to him is by taking away everything that we have and especially financial resources. You then become poor on a, on a resource level, but that's where you feed your spirituality. And what, at least in my experience, when I've gone through periods like that in my life, what's been happening is I've been fueling my, my resilience for what's to come. Because Allah is the best of planners. He knows what's ahead. He knows what he has planned for you after this period. Just you've got to build that. You've got to build that resilience. And yeah, sometimes you want to give up. Mm. But you don't because you trust Allah. You trust Al-Razak, the provider. And you know that he's going he's gonna to open doors at the end. Mm. You know. I'm almost no nostalgic <laughs> of the times where I was broke and struggling because my duas at that time were like so intense I would spend so much more time on the prayer mat and my head in sajda because yes I had a lot to ask for because I was struggling so much but at least I was talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a lot and a lot more and I know that unfortunately a lot of people have that relationship where when things are good the conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala diminishes, it reduces, there's less to say, there's less to ask for. And it shouldn't be like that, really. We should be in constant conversation with him. When we're not asking him for something that we need, we should be thanking him for the things that he has given us. Um, so again, this is a reminder for myself to just focus on that conversation it should be increasing day by day, not reducing when things are good and increasing when things are bad. Because mm. that's what type of friendship is that? That's like a it's it's hypocrisy, really. Mm. Uh, not in the in the bad sense of the term in, in Islam, right? Um, but in the sense that if you had a friend and you only call them when you need them, how would that make them feel? Mm. And we're doing the same thing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or at least. Um, again, reminder to myself. Um, I know you're you're working on something interesting at the moment. Uh, actually, there's two things that you're working on that are super exciting. Which one do I want to talk about first? Okay, let's talk about women in business, Muslim women in business, and the research that you're doing about that in order to write a book on the topic. Yes. So I'm writing. I'm writing a book about Muslim women in business at the moment. And I touched uh, I touched on the subject a little bit in, um, in the conversation previously, but there's something there's something we've all become very aware of is where our money is going when we purchase something. 
it's not just purchasing a product, it's what is that then financing after we've purchased the, the product or the service or whatever. And there's a lot of that going on in the world at the moment. And I think personally, there's a very big role for women to play in changing the dynamic of the world that we know today, which is, it's sick. It's a, it's a not very well world. Um, as women, we have access to so much power within us that, that stems from that spirituality, that stems from intuition, creativity, all of that kind of stuff. But we sometimes struggle to bring that into the material. It can, it can remain very kind of up here. And especially with uh, Muslim women, sorry, I find there's a, a scarcity of role models to go to when it comes to, Mus to, to Muslim women in business. And so the intention with this, this book and the research that I'm um, carrying out is to put, put at the forefront, basically, successful Muslim women in business so that we can then have, draw inspiration from them, essentially. So for anyone who's um, looking to start a business, doesn't really know where to look, uh, wants to stay in line with her values, it's it's telling the stories and telling the success stories of the women that have done it beforehand. So that is why I'm doing this. There's also another one, another kind of intention, which is to paint to paint a true picture of what it is truly like to be a Muslim woman in business. There's a lot of stigma around it. The media has a big role to play in that, but it's it's making it a, a window into the, the, the truth of what Islam is and the truth of what our deen says about being a Muslim woman in business. So that's exciting. Um, I'm working on that with your help, with your support. And, and yeah, looking forward to it. The, the second you started talking to me about this project, I got so excited because I remember when I started this business, um there was a penury how do you say penury in english <laughs> <laughs> a scarcity thank you yeah scarcity <laughs> of muslim women who were doing their own thing who were building businesses that i could look up to and so i had to follow non-muslims and that came with certain consequences which was that sometimes without even knowing i was taking on knowledge that was not right or aligned to our beliefs as Muslims. And alhamdulillah, eventually I, I found my way per se, but finding my way was finding male teachers who were Muslim and who taught me about the deen. It was still not finding Muslim women in business who could take me under their wing and, and show me the way. Now I have my business coach, alhamdulillah, Asiya, who has been this for me for the past year, but it took a while to find her. So it's like, I'm sure there are so many women who are doing incredible work and who are Muslim and their work is not leading them to compromise their Islamic values and lifestyle. But these women are hidden and your project is a way to bring them forward for them to be even more of a source of inspiration for other women, not just the women who are in their direct circle. So... If anyone feel like they could be of any help to Lucy on this project, please get in touch with her um, because she's leading interviews and researching the topic. And I can't wait to read that book because even now that the business is doing well, alhamdulillah, I feel like this book is going to be so useful, not just for me, but for anyone that comes my way that is, that is having any doubts about the fact that you can be a Muslim woman and have a business and be successful, but still be a good Muslim woman. Because I feel like that's that's the main question nowadays. It's like, can I really practice my religion and put myself out there and sell my services and earn a good amount of money without my deen being impacted? And for me, the direct answer is yes, you can, but a lot of women have those doubts that actually know that there's too many contradictions here. So I feel like your book is going to bring an element of reflection, not just for Muslims as well, but as you said, for non-Muslims who have all those stereotypes about Muslim women being 
oppressed. Yes, oppressed. Yes, yes. So <laughs> it's, it's going to be a breath of fresh air, I think, in that sense, because mm -hmm. you're going to come across so many women who have beautiful stories um, and you're going to bring those stories to light for those of us who need that inspiration and who need that wake-up call as well. So exciting, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, tell me. I want to say something on the topic of uh, of being hidden because to tie it back to what we were talking about at the beginning, there, there are not only Muslim business owners that are hidden and therefore no one can see them, therefore no one's looking towards them as role models. But I think there's also another version of hidden, which is tying back to the nine to five. There's a lot of Muslim women that are hidden in a nine to five job and they are again, coming back to this uniqueness in the way that Allah has created them, they are natural entrepreneurs. They just don't know how to get started. And I think the combination of these two categories of women, so the ones that are doing it already that need to come to the forefront to be role models, and the ones that are in a nine to five that need to come out of the nine to five and build what it is that they're being called to build, that ultimately, I think, brings about change, real change. And it builds an ecosystem where you're not having to necessarily compromise on your values, compromise on your Islamic values. And because there is so much knowledge in the Ummah, there is so much potential. It's just hidden. It's really hidden. And that's what needs to come to come to the light. <laughs> and to the woman who's having those urges and that strong voice to become an entrepreneur, I just want to let you know that voice is never going <laughs> to disappear. Never. So <laughs> you can try and, and lie to yourself and tell yourself that it's just a phase or uh, it's too risky, there's too much at stake and all of that. That voice is never going to die. So you might as well feed it and try something for yourself. What's the worst that can happen? Exactly. And when you have tawakkul, nothing's going to happen to you because because Allah's going to Allah's going to provide for you in some way. Yes, it will be hard. That is a given. It will be hard. There will be times of uh strain, times of test, but ultimately it's all worth it. For me personally, I'm sure you you feel the same like I I don't regret one bit of starting my own business like never ever ever it's like it gives you freedom it gives you it gives you everything it gives you the the freedom to create especially and that to me is priceless so, yeah. mm. I, I was taking a walk this morning and I bumped into uh, a woman who used to be my housemate when I, I first came back to the UK and I didn't have anything and subhanAllah, the question that I get when I bump into people from the past is, are you still doing your thing? And it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm still doing my thing. My thing is is sustaining me to the point where I can do whatever I want, alhamdulillah. Um, so yeah, for me, it's definitely a no regrets at all type of thing right now, alhamdulillah. It's even more than that. It's a huge gratitude for the lifestyle that this business has offered me and and how big it has become with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I could have never imagined it to be this way. And I'm the first one to tell women, this could be you as well. Um, it can be, it can be you if you believe and you put in the work. Those two things tie your camel, right? Make dua and tie your camel and keep on relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and keep on trying and trying and trying. People don't know this, but I've had many businesses before this one. And they were all terrible and unsuccessful. <laughs> I've made things that I could never show to anyone because they were so ugly. But I had to go through that in order to learn from my mistakes. Um, the first business is, is really the successful one. Like you have to keep on trying again and renewing your ideas and renewing your circles and pushing yourself to the limit. That's how it works. Now, talking about pushing yourself, you're also doing a 30-day challenge at the moment yes. with many intentions. Um, about about the intentions. So the challenge is called Courage to Create, 
And it's a 30 day challenge, which essentially um, brings us into the courage to get started with a business project, anything that we're building. And it's hosted on Telegram. It's in a, a private community. And it's for anyone who's working on a business idea, even if it's very vague, but at the very core of starting anything is mindset work. And that's what the challenge is about. So every single day, there's something that challenges our mindset about creation, about the courage to get that out. Because linked to this idea of, I'm going to start something, there's a lot of doubt that comes up. There's a lot of, what are people going to think? It's not perfect yet. All of that's going to come up. And it's having the courage to push through that and building the, the habits and the structure to enable you to build something which is going to sustain you in the future. Sounds amazing. And what motivated you to do this? Um, well, it was a personal challenge from you. <laughs> in, right. all, in all honesty. Um, no, because it's it's a journey that I'm on myself. It's the courage to the courage to create, the courage to shine your light, the courage to um, listen to that voice, that nagging voice that is telling you you've got to build something. It's not going to go away, as you said. And it's working through the mindset blocks that come up and that are going to be there. And again, linked to everything we've been speaking about, it's giving the women the tools to, to just push through it. Because if we are able to do that, what's on the other side is just, it's, it's incredible. It's yeah. businesses that are for the sake of Allah, It's um, sustenance for us, for our family, not even talking about purpose and, and kind of fulfillment, all of that's on the other side of it. So once we push through, everything else unlocks. Yeah. I, mean, I want to go deeper on to the consequences, the positive side of taking that risk. Like for me, the first thing I think about is my daughter as well, like the example mm -hmm. that I'm giving her. So my parents were immigrants to France from Morocco and, and they had a lot of fears associated with stability because they had experienced being not stable, not being stable and, and a lot of insecurities in, in their risk and in their jobs, uh, discrimination, racism and all of that. And what they passed on to me is this idea of like you have to fit into what is normality in society. So that means get your degree, get a good job, get married, have kids, buy a house if you can. My daughter is being brought up with a completely different story. A little bit too hippie sometimes, but <laughs> I'm literally telling her and teaching her, you can do whatever you want as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is at the center of your life. Um, and I'm trying to push her to be a hafida and, and these things, of course because I want to go to Jannah. <laughs> But the, the main focus here is like, I'm, I'm not endorsing this idea onto her that she needs to get a degree. If she decides to not go to college, I will be fine with it. My parents had a completely different um, vision and perception of the world. Like for them, degree equals stability because in France, um, you know how it is as, as an immigrant, if you don't have a lot to back you up and make you look successful or serious, you are going to fail anyway. You might even fail as a Muslim and Moroccan immigrant with the highest degrees in France. So my parents were, try were trying to equip me, rather, with the best tools as possible for me to be successful based on society's definition of success. I'm passing on a completely different definition to my daughter. Um, and I feel like even if everything was to come to an end, for me to be able to do that is me letting go of a lot of generational trauma already. And maybe that's that 1% of doing better for the next generation already, alhamdulillah. That's one of the positive consequences of, of being a, a Muslim woman in business, being my own boss, not being limited to uh, a lot of... Um, societal restrictions mm -hmm. there's so many more like there's so much more in terms of freedom to not have to ask for holidays 
to do pretty much anything, whether it's spiritual activities or uh, traveling to prioritize family and all of these things. SubhanAllah, like I cannot imagine what it would be like to have to ask for holidays. Mm -hmm. There's something that I like to use, which uh, which is fun, which is it's make Allah your CEO. So instead of coming back to the nine to five, if you're if you're working a nine to five, you have a CEO, you have a boss. Quit that, have the courage to quit it, and make Allah your CEO. Because when you do that, Allah is going to provide, and it takes you trusting trusting Allah to provide and to to guide you and to show you the way. But yes, all of that then comes, the freedom, the the breaking of the narrative, and it takes it takes courage. It really, really does. But it's make Allah your CEO, subhanAllah, and, and trust that the ideas that you've got in your heart are there for a reason, and to just run with them, just run with them. Mm. Absolutely. Alhamdulillah. That's a beautiful way to end, I think. Making Allah your CEO, that's like the cherry on top of this conversation. <laughs> Was there anything else that you wanted to tell the sister who's listening um, to this conversation, Lucy? Believe in yourself, but I think more than believing in yourself, it's believe in your creator, believe in the one that placed you here, the one that fashioned you, the one that has given you capabilities that no one else has. Believe in that and believe in that more than anything, and run with it, and trust, tawakkul, mm. and your dreams, your dreams do come true, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes them come true, it uh, takes you believing in them. Absolutely, thank you so much for your time, um, where can people find you if they want to work with you, or even help with yes. your book, or participate in the challenge? The easiest way to find me is probably on my Instagram, um, which I'm sure will be linked in, in the notes. Um, on Instagram, I'm also on LinkedIn. So if there is anyone that comes to mind for the book project, a successful Muslim woman in business, I would love to speak to her. If uh, you're on a journey of building a business or you've got a project or some kind of venture, I invite you to join the 30-day challenge. It's entirely free. It's running until... October 14th, if I'm not mistaken. So you can also find that on my Instagram. Come join the community. And if anything resonated, then also please just send me a message because I love a hello. So thank you. Thank you immensely. May Allah bless you. Thank you for, for who you are and everything you do. And pleasure. I mean, I mean, thank you for being such an amazing client. Alhamdulillah, you are the one who inspired me for the mastermind because I was like, oh my God, I want to coach 10 more Lucy's, but I don't <laughs> have the time. So let me create a group coaching program so I can get more of that energy, Alhamdulillah, because it's feeding me just as much as I hope I'm feeding you as well, inshallah. Yes. Thank, thank you so much for your time, Allah bless you.